What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of PNAX, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Prosper Show e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. They have an amazing conference from the top Amazon sellers and industry leaders like we have Scott today. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, eight-figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. It's application only. Today, I'm very excited. We have Scott Galveo, he's co-founder of Intercultural Elements, also known as ICE, a German-based company with over 50 employees, which helps retailers expand e-commerce sales internationally, which we'll talk about. Before Intercultural Elements, he cut his teeth working on a wide range of international e-commerce for more than six years at Auction Master and Channel Advisor UK as an implementation manager. And from my research, Scott, ICE is often incorrectly pigeonholed as a translation company, but it's more accurately described as an A to Z service provider. So I'm going to have you talk about some of the things that you provide, which maybe people who know you don't even know about. Uh, A random fact about Scott is he holds a degree in both intercultural communication and geography from University of New Mexico, and he's lived in Germany from 2000. Scott, thanks for joining me. Hey, Jeremy. Thanks so much for having me. You know, we talked before and, you know, the intercultural is like, I just picture you popping out of the womb and having like a onesie with intercultural communication on it or something. Like, it seems so random. Why did you major in intercultural communication? Well, you know, I think popping out of the womb with a... With that, I'd be, yeah, that, that, that fits a little bit. Uh, so my dad is Portuguese. Uh, my mom is American. So yeah, from the get-go, I, I couldn't really get around it, right? Um, it's sort of funny story, actually. My mom and my dad, when they first met, um, they spoke this really weird mix of Portuguese and Spanish because my dad, again, being Portuguese, my mom had studied in Puerto Rico so she could speak uh, fluent fluent Spanish. He could too. Uh, but yeah, this this weird language mix started popping up in our home. Uh, so they always spoke this weird mix together. They spoke English with us. Um, so yeah, you know, I couldn't get away from it after that, right? So was it something that you just, did you feel different growing up from the other kids around you because of the intercultural? Right. So I grew up in southeastern Massachusetts and uh, there's a lot of Portuguese influence there. Hmm. But um, so I, I think, you know, by and large, I felt like I sort of belonged to that. But yeah, you're right. It's that there was a little bit more of a draw, I think. Um, my dad's uh, business as I was growing up also had to do with sort of Portuguese music mm. um, and very intercultural. He traveled quite a bit. So, yeah, I, I think I caught the bug from him as well. So when you were younger, Scott, like high school wise, what did you want to be when you grew up? Good question. I think I really wanted to follow my heart. Um, more than a job, I knew that I wanted to live in some foreign country. You did? Um, so at yeah, that I point, mean, you I, knew you'd, you'd kind of venture out? I, I knew that I would venture out. I had no idea where or, or for how long. Um, but, you know, I've, I've always loved the States, but I always knew that I, I had this this calling to, you know, to, to see life outside the States. And, uh, yeah, I thought that that would probably bring me to sort of Portugal, France, maybe where I also have some family. But um, ended up being Germany. So, so auction master is that what brought you to Germany? Um, my wife actually brought me to Germany. Oh, really? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So we uh, we met in in uh, this traveling sort of uh, group called Up with People uh, back way back. Gosh, now like 1999, 2000. Uh, and uh, funny enough, that that's also where we met uh, our other business partner because uh, my two business partners are actually my wife, who's German, and uh-huh. uh, another business partner named Edward, who's Dutch. Yeah. And the three of us founded the company so, back in 2007. So Anna, or Anna, how do you pronounce it? Uh, Anya. Anya. So Anya yeah. is your wife and the co-founder, one of the co-founders. Correct. Correct. Okay, yep. cool. Yeah. So, so what would she, you guys, when you moved to Germany, you were working at um, Auction Master. What was she doing at the time? 
Right. Uh, well, at the, in the very beginning, I was working as an English teacher for professionals, but okay. then very quickly, one of my uh, clients in that project was actually Auction Master. Mm. Uh, so Auction Master, it's a relatively small company now, but it was bought by Channel Advisor. Right. Uh, but it was basically one of the dominant listing tools back in the, the sort of the early days of e-commerce, mm. right? Like early 2000s. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I was brought on as sort of the head of the English uh, language department, so to say. So I would help You're all the... in Spanish, fluent in English, obviously, and fluent in German? Uh, so, yes. Yeah. Uh, Spanish is, I, I wouldn't say that. Uh, it, it's okay-ish. Portuguese is okay-ish. Uh, but yeah, German, you know, I've been here for 17 years, so I would hope that I would. So. <laughs> <laughs> if not, I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> um, so for you, and I want to get into kind of the big mistakes people make when expanding abroad, but what did you learn from Auction Master and Channel Advisor? Because obviously you were there for six years. You probably got a lot of great experience. You know, absolutely. And I, I think that was one of the, uh, the first formative experiences for me to know how important this uh, intercultural communication is in a real world aspect, right? Because back then I had studied it, you know, I'd seen quite a bit in, in Up With People, but uh, that was the first time that I saw um, what ended up being this potential merger between these two companies, which actually were sort of made for each other. It was a really good match. Uh, but it, it got onto some really rocky ground Why? during the yeah, during the negotiation phase. Um, yeah, it, basically, I think there were just some, some basic intercultural uh, misunderstandings that were happening because I think the, you know, the, my, the American team that I was working with had uh, some fundamental, I think, misgivings or misunderstandings about uh, Auction Master and, and same vice versa. Um, so that was one experience where I sort of came out of my normal role there and, um, and jumped in as an intercultural coach. And, and I, hopefully that helped a little bit, um, you know, of that, that communication, but what ended up some uh, of the going through. Pause of that? Like what was, what were the like channel advisor thought they were communicating a certain way, but it was completely offending the auction master people. Right. Um, I, you know, the experience that I'm thinking of was actually sort of the other way around. Um, oh, really? And, uh, okay. and I'm probably seeing this more from an American perspective, okay. right? So my, my I always wife picture and I, the American people offending other people. So me, <laughs> yeah. It's I, I think it could be an even mix, okay. right? So, but uh, but in any case, uh, you, you know, a lot of it has to do with with subtle things, right? Things that people don't necessarily even pick up on. Um, mm -hmm. Nonverbals, for example. Uh, one interesting fact is, you know, if you're an American going to Germany then what we like to do as Americans is we'll nod, right? You yeah. tell me something and I nod just as an acknowledgement that I've heard what you said, right? Well, in Germany, by and large, that means that I've acknowledged you. Not only have I acknowledged you, but I, I agree with what you're saying. So um, it just so happened that during a lunch break, there was a conversation going on about back then about, uh, yeah, basically the invasion of, of Iraq, and um, a German person brought this up, which, number one, is not necessarily something you do with an American, but uh, politics, <laughs> is it's not such a faux pas thing to talk about. Right. So they brought it up on a lunch break. Yeah. And um, as this conversation was going on, the American wanted nothing to do with, con with this conversation whatsoever. So they were just nodding, looking at, down at their computer. And uh, the German took this the entire time to mean, well, of course, you agree with me. So he just kept on getting deeper and deeper and deeper until the American <laughs> almost blew up and just said, do not <laughs> talk about this. Uh, so yeah, and it, you know, little things like that, it can affect a, a whole process, a whole merger. What about from the channel advisor side when it was taken, when auction master was taken over by channel advisor, what were some of the things you learned that you then took with you when you started intercultural elements? Right. You know, I think the importance of, um, of effective communication, um, you know, that's, as you said, very often, you know, we have this, this idea that, uh, you know, Americans, uh, don't necessarily, you know, cater to other, uh, cultures from what I find, it has a lot less to do with sort of a national nationality in general. It has a lot to do with your just intercultural understanding and this, you know, there's great examples from all countries. Right. Uh, but I saw some really good examples from channel advisor, also some, some ones that could be improved on. Um, but yeah, that, that importance of intercultural communication, that's what I really took over. And that's one of the founding elements of intercultural elements. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how did you decide to then start intercultural elements? Good question. So, uh, right back when I was working for channel advisor, um, 
we had the typical problem that we had. Uh, the, you know, my job was to teach British, uh, new British sellers how to use the Channel Advisor software. So I would be uh, teaching them for usually a period of a week or two. And at the end of that process, they would say, wow, this is great. You know, listing tools, perfect. You know, you can sell all over the world, all these different marketplaces. Uh, but now we need somebody to translate it, to localize it. And then we need customer service at the end of that. Mm. And at that point, I said, uh, I sort of flagged that with Channel Advisor and said, you know, this is a great opportunity for right. us. Um, no one was doing point, it at the time. Nobody was doing it at the time. Exactly. I mean, cross-border trade back then, there was no term for it. It was just, you know, the random sale across borders, right? Mm. Uh, so in any case, back then, I, I flagged that with Channel Advisor. And um, I think back then, you know, I, I don't think it was so much of, uh, of a core competence that they wanted to pursue at the time. Right. Um, I think everybody sort of jumped on that bag bandwagon since. But back then, it wasn't necessarily a priority. Uh, but, you know, a couple of, uh, of, of really great co colleagues that I had back then, they said, you know, if you guys want to found a company on this, you, know, you sort you of that. have expertise in that, hmm. then, you know, we definitely help support that. And, um, and actually from the first year back in 2007, um, yeah, you know, we've been partners with Channel Advisor and, and ever since have really expanded out, I have a whole bunch of partners since then. But, uh, but yeah, that was, that was the first partnership. So that we Scott, had. did they say, were you starting this on the side or did you like, well, you have to quit and start? you know, then just go cold turkey and start this. Right. So one thing that, that myself and Anya and, and Edward have always said is that, you know, all relationships, all partnerships have to be completely transparent and they have to be uh, mutually beneficial. Yeah. And I think that was the best example. So a lot of people said, my gosh, you know, w w what is this deal, right? It's like you're working for two companies, right? Um, but it wasn't that at all. Um, so you're right. Anya and, and Edward started the company back in 2007 full time. And um, I stayed on as uh, a channel advisor employee for a number of years, um, but it was perfect. It was a symbiotic relationship because as soon as a seller would get done learning channel advisor, yeah. they would almost naturally ask that question, okay, yeah. if I want to sell to France, Germany, et cetera, how do I do that? And then I could say, okay, well, we do have a partner who may, might be able to help you with this. So it helps so, with retention perfect. essentially for people to be, stay on channel advisor because you're able to take on the next mile type of thing? That's exactly it. So that at what point do you decide, okay, this is getting too successful, it's too busy, I need to, to you know, kind of cross over and do intercultural elements full time? Right. So uh, that was, at least from my uh, switch over, that was 2011. Um, and by is that, that tough time for we had, you or no? Well, you know, by that time we had six or seven employees and it was getting to the point in time where we said, we thought, you know, this could really run on its own. Yeah. Um, we also thought that it was, it was really time to have, you know, a full time sort of sales and marketing person. Um, and, and me as a native speaker, I've just sort of jumped into that position. Um, so it was, it was tough leaving um, a, a great family because, you know, you know, I, and there's a lot of sort of pros and cons against listing tools and channel advisor itself, but I always found it to be just a great company to work for and, uh, and really enjoyed my colleagues there. So to that extent, it was tough to leave that, but really exciting to jump into my own thing. As well. So Scott, what were the original services you provided? Because I'm sure when you first started, it was different from it is now. So can you compare, like what were the services then and what are they now? Right. And, you know, this alludes back to what you mentioned uh, right at the beginning, uh, you know, of, of uh, you know, this recording, too, where we're very often pigeonholed into translation because we started off really primarily with translation, uh, with this second bit of getting that translation then uploaded via a listing tool um, into Amazon and eBay and online marketplaces. Uh, but, yeah, those two components were really it at the beginning. Yeah. So the translation was it which markets were you translating to? Uh, primarily Germany, uh, France, we picked up pretty soon afterwards. And then, yeah, and then every so often we had German clients who wanted to go to the UK. So really, uh, those main markets. And so that was for eBay and Amazon? Correct. Yeah. So that was when you started now compared to now, what, what type of services do you have now? Obviously you still have the translation. Right, right, right. But, you know, as you also correctly said, you know, really this A to Z service. So our goal is to make it so that if you are a seller selling online, most likely you're doing really well domestically, but you don't necessarily have the in-house resource to be able to expand abroad. Of course, you know, you want to run the, ex the, uh, the international expansion as well as you run your business domestically. But to do that, you need the expertise, and that's where you can outsource to us. So we handle everything from, number one, building a strategy for you 
take a look at your products, figure out where your items might be able to sell well, which countries and which marketplaces, because there's a lot of possibilities out there. Yeah. After we build that strategy, then we implement it by doing things like translation. So we have professional translators here in house uh, to be able to uh, do all of that for you. It's also really important that you have e-commerce specialized translators because those are the people that uh, they know where to put the search terms, how long the title should be, right. you know, where you put bullet points, et cetera. So translation, we localize it to make sure that uh, you know, there are differences between pants, trousers, different sizing, currencies, all that is really important. Uh, but then all the way through, I think one of the, the most exciting things that we've added really in the last couple of years is managed care. Hmm. Um, and that? that Right. So that, that really makes a difference. What we used to do is, you know, we used to translate it and then put it into, let's say, Amazon Japan. But just because the seller is now selling on Amazon Japan doesn't mean that they know China, uh, uh, they know uh, Japanese overnight. Uh, so to that extent, yeah. they really need somebody to be, you know, caretaking, right, maintaining that listing and, uh, and tweaking it over time, just like they were doing their domestic listings. So we can do that for them as well. So we have account managers here from 16 countries. And um, so you always have a native speaker hmm. to watch your account, to maintain it, and then to proactively expand you onto more countries as well. So if someone comes in, let's say, for translation, and then they realize you have other things, other services, what's the most popular service outside of the translation that people uh, use you for? Right. So, you know, more and more, it is this managed care. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it really sort of checks a box that a lot of people have, have been missing, I think, in the last years. Um, and it really, I mean, even for us, it took a while for us to be able to build up to that, to offer that um, as completely as we do. Um, and then I think after that, you know, post-sale, people really need customer service um, in those native languages to be able to make sure that they, uh, you know, keep all that positive feedback coming in. Um, so that's something that we do as well. And then uh, not, not for, uh, sort of last but, uh, but not least, uh, we also have return service. So, uh, you know, of course, Amazon demands that you have this local return uh, warehouse in every country that you sell to. Mm. So we also have partnered with a company uh, to be able to, to cater to that. So as you can see, it's really this A to Z solution all the way through. So Scott, for common customers what would you say the most common is it like germany uk uk to german do you serve uh people in the us what are what are some common i guess uh, avenues that people use you for right yeah so very much depends uh on where the the seller is based so we have customers as you mentioned sort of us based uh lots in in the uk germany mm -hmm. and then sprinkling throughout france italy you know, you name it. Uh, but right, so a lot of American sellers really like to expand into Amazon Europe. And it was, it was funny, just a week and a half ago, I was giving a speech on this. And, and uh, some of the key uh, countries that we, that we uh, focused on was the UK. That tends to be a really great place, especially if you like uh, and feel comfortable with Amazon. Mm -hmm. The UK can be a, a great place to go into because the flat files are quite similar, all that. Um, having said that, I would give the warning to anybody listening that, you know, there, there are enough subtle things that which do differ uh, that you have to watch out for, right? Everything from sort of the obvious ones like currency, but sizing can be quite different. Hmm. Um, then, you know, all the, like the localization is really necessary with terminology, right? And those, those subtle search terms like sneaker, trainer are very often the exact words that those buyers are actually typing in to search for. So if right. you don't get those right, you're going to be dead in the water. Right. So where else do you recommend if someone's going to U.S. and expanding? Is there a certain um, like pattern you recommend? First you go U.K., then you expand this way? Yeah, good question. It's really hard to, to, uh, to give a, a cookie cutter concept because everybody's different, right? Um, and here's where I go back to this. The first part of what we do for people is create a strategy for them. Uh, because you have to take a look at their products, figure out, uh, number one, where based on our experience where we feel like they uh, would have a real go, number one, the country, and then secondly, which marketplaces within that country. Um, I think if I were to try to give more of a sort of a cookie cutter concept, right? Um, you know, I think UK, Germany, France tend to be really good European markets to go into. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say if, if, you know, a lot of your listeners are located in the US, then we've seen a lot of success on uh, markets like Amazon Mexico. Very often you have niches there that people have not uh, bothered going into. Mm -hmm. um, Amazon Japan, we've seen tremendous success for a lot of our sellers really? uh, there mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but of course, there's, you know, there's, there's little things in each of those marketplaces that you have to pay attention to for when you sure. go there. 
So what are some of the, you know, in the very beginning, we talk about, you know, expanding abroad and the big mistakes people make. I'm sure they make a lot of them. What are some of the like common ones that you see? Because I'm sure my guess is maybe I'm wrong. Um, they try and do it themselves and then they realize they can't and then they right. come to you. Right, right, exactly. And we have like an hour to talk about this. Could we? <laughs> so right now it's you're absolutely right. And there's, there's a whole bunch here. Um, trying to do it yourself. It's it's a logical thing for most sellers to do because let's face it, right? We're all entrepreneurs, right? right. This is how we founded our businesses. You know, we like to get our hands dirty. Um, but I think the smart ones of us also know when it's time to outsource. Right. So uh, translation, right? The most obvious one. A lot of people say, well, you know, Google Translate's out there. And granted, it is pretty impressive. And, you know, for, for certain things, Google Translate, you know, it, it, it does all right. But the way that I like to say it is that, you know, if you... You know, you think of all the blood, blood uh, sweat, and tears that you've poured into that perfect title, that great description, you know, the bullet right. points exactly as you want them. Now, would you ever think about having a machine create that for you? Of course you wouldn't, right? So why would you ever do that when you're trying to list abroad and you can't even check the quality? So people just throw it into Google Translate and then just slap it up there type of and, thing. And hope for the best. And, you know, yeah. we talked to, it was funny, I was speaking to a, a seller um, out of Indiana this morning. And um, this gentleman was saying how he... Uh, you know, he did exactly that, expanded into four different countries. Uh, the problem was that months later, he cannot figure out why he's not selling anything. We looked at the ad and we're just like, my goodness, this was Google Translated, wasn't it? And, uh, you know, I, yeah. I, <laughs> it's although like a, yeah. a first grader trailer or something, yeah. It, exactly, exactly. And, uh, and one thing that I would say uh, really does differ is that in countries like the U.S. and the U.K., I think people are, are a little bit more forgiving with badly translated or yeah sort of lacking language skills <laughs> in some of the listings um but in countries like france and germany and japan definitely you have to be spot on because if you're not if people are going to disregard it just out of, yeah, to yeah. Digits, they're, they're not going to look at it so big mistakes in translation what other big mistakes do you see right um translation tools so we talked about that um there are hidden dangers in translation tools great example that i like to give is there's a uk based uh seller who we have and he sells all types of sort of heavy leather clothing right biker clothing and um does great in the uk when he wanted to expand to germany before he came to intercultural elements he utilized a rather inexpensive company that used machine translations now uh to be fair the translations of the words were actually okay-ish. Uh, the real problem came when his sizes were not converted. Mm. So every time you saw UK 34, it translated it, right, to uh, DE 34. The problem is the sizing is completely different from one to another. So that means every they were single... They a lot of returns. Yeah, and that's the whole thing. He ended up hiring somebody just to handle the returns. Um, that's, you know, that's one of the reasons why we say cheap translations can very often cause very expensive mistakes. Mm -hmm. So what's another horror story you've seen? Horror story. Um, right. Gosh, I, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of them. Uh, I think, you know, that, that, <laughs> that's one of them. Uh, similar thing, just maybe ratcheted up a little bit. Uh, there was a German seller who used a very similar, um, let's say, product service uh, that utilizes machine translations to sell to the States. Now, they thought that they had everything sort of taken care of when uh, they did check on things like sizes and stuff like that. Uh, but what they found was there was size differentiations even between different brands. Mm. So uh, that's one of the things that, for example, you know, with our local uh, or with our in-house translators and localizers, this is something, you know, they'll check brand to brand because they know this. Uh, but the machine didn't. And similar situation except quite a bit more costly every pair of shoes that went up went across the pond had to come back and of course on his dime wow. so yeah so it's so really tough um I, I think yeah just i won't even go into the numbers there but uh the seller was was yeah they lost a happy. lot of money yeah you know i was watching one um talk that you did and you talked about um, you've had to change people's i don't know if it was companies names because it was maybe offensive or um, something it just it didn't sit right in that particular culture. Is there some examples you can give of before and afters? Right, right. Um, I'll, I'll give a similar one. Okay. Right? Uh, so the you know we we've basically had uh, one rather recently. Um, something is as unassuming as the word flip flop, right? Flip flop. We use it all the time. 
So did you know that uh, when one of our sellers actually wanted to sell flip-flops in Germany, uh, we knew enough just historically that flip-flop is actually a, uh, a copyrighted term in Germany. Hmm, really? So even by listing flip-flops in Germany, uh, they, would ha they, they could theoretically be sued. So that was one thing that you, know, you have to change the name of. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, company, company names as well. You know, it's, it can really be worth actually just changing them just depending on, on you know, um, maybe because they're offensive? Like, is it because it just means something in that particular culture that would be offensive? It, it, it could, yeah. It could be, exactly. And uh, yeah, and in cases like that, you just sort of have to change it. Very often, too, uh, you know, there's just different terminologies, right? Uh, things are used for, for different, uh, uh, in different ways. Um, an example was a seller that I met rather recently. Um, he sells all types of uh, products, you know, kitchenwares and things like that. Um, but you know, instead of doing sort of a one-to-one -one, uh, translation, we'll take, you know, a colander or something like that. And when we're describing that colander, we're going to give different foods that Italians would use versus mm. French. Right. Um, and that type of thing is going to get you more hits and more sales. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and so I want to talk about a few case studies, right? So you have, a, you have a few. I think you mentioned the Bikers Gear one. There's Thorough Good okay. Sports. Can you talk about Thorough Good Sports a little bit, uh, what they came to you for, and then... Um, what happened um, after? Right, exactly. Yeah. So, so Thoroughgood Sports. Uh, I think that was a little bit more of our sort of standard service, right? Mm. Um, I think at the very beginning, you know, they they wanted to expand, uh, but they didn't necessarily know exactly which marketplaces to go onto. Um, and uh, and through that, where were you know, they based us, out of? So they're based out of the UK. Out of UK. London. Okay. Yeah, great guys over there, and uh, uh, yeah, very very entrepreneurial minded. Uh, very much wanted to expand it into uh, expand into a lot of foreign countries, but didn't necessarily know exactly where to go to. And uh, that was where we came in, uh, did a bit of a, a strategy, like looked at all of their their sportswear products, and we found that there would be certain countries uh, that they would do specifically well in, hmm. right? Uh, so Germany, France specifically, um, and then we found that there were certain marketplaces in there. So Amazon always a pretty good. Yet, right, but some of their products actually would run really well on eBay. Others on C Discount in France, hmm. um, and uh, so you and look at all other, the marketplaces, not just Amazon. You, you really have to because yeah. uh, you know France is a great example where it's such a federated landscape. If if you imagine sort of the the French e-commerce uh, as sort of a pie, right, then you have a lot more divisions of that pie. So the pieces of the pie are a lot. Uh, there are a lot more, and there are a lot more evenly distributed. Yeah. Um, so it makes sense if you're going to you know, go through the expense of getting it properly translated and localized, uh, you might as well sell that on La Redoute, for example, if you can get on there, um, as well as Amazon, because you're going to hit different clientels. Scott, so are there are cases where you recommend someone not to go international, like a certain product or something like that? Yeah, I, absolutely. Um, I would say more specifically, sometimes it's, it's not very easy to go into certain countries. Um, you know, you know, staying on the example of France can be really, really difficult to get any sort of medicinal products on there. So mm. any of you out there selling anything like, um, yeah, health and beauty, right? When you do describe your product, when you, when you have that translated, um, you know, us at Intercultural Elements, the translators, they make sure to not reflect that it's, that it's a medicine if it's not a medicine. Mm. Uh, it's an, a very easy thing to, to fall into if you just give it to sort of translator who doesn't know anything about Amazon or about uh, French Amazon specifically. They'll translate it uh, and it'll seem like a medicine and Amazon will not let it go online. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, depending on the product, certain countries work better than others. Um, I think it's a rare case when we say people shouldn't expand abroad uh, because there's usually opportunities out there for pretty much everybody. So what's Tartanista? Right, Tartanista. Yeah, so um, also some really great guys. Uh, based I, their the taglines is like heritage, hedonism, and happiness. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what, what is <laughs> but, it? Yeah, but uh, really, really great guys. That gives you a little bit of a feeling of, uh, of the owners there. Um, but uh, absolutely, um, you know, great business to work with. We've had them as, uh, you know, as a customer for years and years. And... Um, you know, funny story about these guys, they sell all types of, uh, all types of products, but uh, one of their core lines is all types of kilts and all the accessories for kilts, mm. okay? And, Where um, are they based out of? So they're based out of the UK, okay. uh, but they have, a, I think, some strong ties to Scotland. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but, you know, the, the, the funny thing there is that, you know, when you expand something as unassuming as a kilt, right, to a country like Spain, right, most people think, well, you just translate it and you're good to go, right? 
Are people Not buying really. kilts in Spain? And, and this is the whole thing, right? Yeah. So, so uh, you know, when we expanded them to Spain, we found out that we actually were catering to three different types of, of people. Number one, Spaniards who had been to to, uh, uh, to Scotland, and mm-hmm. they knew exactly what these things were called. So we had to put those ser- search terms in English, even in the Spanish listings. Right. Uh, but then secondarily, Spaniards who they wanted to buy kilts, but they didn't really know what to look for, so they just put in the, the Spanish terms. And then funny enough, if you do your research, we also found out that uh, there's a rugby team in Spain that wears kilts. So then you throw in a bunch of those search terms, mm. and, um, and you can get a lot more hits. So, yeah, so, but Tartanista, you know, great products there. Interesting. So, talk about expanding the team because you guys have over 50 people. How yeah. do you mean, and probably in different countries, how do you maintain the culture of intercultural elements? Right, right. Well, it, it's easier to do than you would think uh, because we're, we are actually all located in Germany. You are? Okay. And, yeah, yeah. And uh, so, and that has that sort of part and parcel to do with the city that we're in, uh, a city called Leipzig. I've lived here for, for a number of years and absolutely love it one of my favorite German cities and um, has a, a big university with a lot of international students. So a lot of people come study here and they don't necessarily want to leave. Um, so yeah, decent sized city, over half a million people. So great place to visit. If How do you there. split the roles between you, Anya and Edward? Right. So the, the three of us, basically, uh, I'm responsible mostly for sales and marketing. Um, Anya takes care of uh, a lot of the, the human resource and just sort of general German administration. That takes a position in itself. Uh, and then we also have uh, Edward, who's doing a lot of the, the tech stuff and more um, yeah, organizational stuff. So there's obviously, well, maybe not. What are the advantages and disadvantages of working with your wife? I was going to say there's <laughs> obviously advantages, but um, I'll... <laughs> Right, right, right. Exactly, exactly. Uh, I'll start with the disadvantages and move to the advantages, okay. right? So we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that uh, she sees this. So you don't, you don't... <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's it's no secret, right? So uh, in any case, I think I think the disadvantage is that you talk way too much about work uh, when you're outside of work, right? And uh, so both of us have a bit of a safety button where we'll say, okay, look, I, I think I just need some time off from work right now, <laughs> and uh, and we both respect that. That's a that's really vital in a relationship, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, but it's, it's a complete pro because, you know, this, she's it, it, really just to be honest, and I'm not just saying this, you know, she's really the smartest woman I know. And to that extent, to have her ability um, and also her, her abilities to learn things and, and you know, she has, she's, she's actually a, she has a master in psychology, right? So she was a psychologist before this, but mm-hmm. to see how she's switched over her, her abilities and skills uh, to turn that into, uh, you know, a great HR manager has been really inspiring to see. Yeah. So yeah, in any case. What have been some big challenges that you had to overcome? Yeah, big challenges. Um, you know, I think I think one of the biggest challenges is really just trying to keep up with the markets. Um, you know, this e-commerce is such a dynamic uh, time. It's, it's the same thing that makes it really exciting can make yeah. it challenging. Right. Um, so the, the, so many companies coming and going and new marketplaces. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the biggest thing for us has really been able to try to keep up with the needs of our clients. And, and luckily, I, I, I hope that we've been able to do that in developing all these different services. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You know, a great example is when uh, Amazon, you know, and when was it? February of 2016, I believe. Um, all of a sudden uh, comes out with this demand that, you know, to be able to, uh, cater to, or 2015 rather, I think. Uh, but, you know, if you want to sell in a foreign country, then you need to have a returns warehouse in that country. Mm. Uh, you know, that flattened a lot of sellers really quickly where, you know, they said, well, gosh, what's going to happen if I don't have this, right? Um, and, uh, you know, to that extent, we were able to, to turn around quite quickly, uh, form a partnership with a... Yeah. Quite That's when your phone starts ringing off the hook. You're like, what what yeah. Amazon change? <laughs> You're Ex- getting like 30 calls a day. Exactly. Well, it's funny, you know, now that you mentioned that, Amazon sent out a mass email to, to sellers back a couple of weeks ago. And you, absolutely right. We're just like, what happened here, you know? So, but, um, but yeah, so... To be able to really, you know, keep, um, you know, your ear to the ground and, and cater to that, that's one of the biggest yeah. challenges, but also what makes it so exciting. Yeah, so, Scott, you probably have your finger on the pulse of these things. What are some of the trends you're seeing with marketplaces in UK and Germany? What's, what would you tell someone, yeah, like, don't worry about that. That's maybe not exploding, and this one is on the up and coming. Right. Well, you know, it'll come as no surprise that Amazon is really continuing their domination. Right. And yeah. whereas, 
you know, it, it was it was funny when you were mentioning uh, eBay and Amazon way back when, when when I was working for Channel Advisor and Auction Master. I mean, eBay was the big thing, right? Mm. And everybody was trying to get their auctions up there. And um, and you know, as time goes on, you know, I think a great starter marketplace for most listeners would probably be Amazon. Yeah. Um, but don't stop there. Um, yeah. I think a, a trend that we see is, you know, there is such a fragmentation in so many of these countries, like France, I mentioned, Germany as well. Um, and then as these other countries develop, uh, you know, Italy, Spain, et cetera, that fragmentation offers a lot of opportunity for you. If you know which marketplaces cater to your clientele, you should definitely go on, get on there as well. Mm -hmm. What yeah. are some of the marketplaces to watch um, in like UK and Germany? I know it may depend on category, like clothing or whatever the case is, but what are some, you know, like you said, eBay was big and then Amazon just started dominating. What, what do you think, maybe they won't take over Amazon, but what's some of the next big things, uh, marketplaces to, to watch out for? Right. A couple of nice ones. Um, you know, ones like Zalando, that's really sort of right up the road from us. Uh, Berlin is, is not too, uh, too, too far away. Um, you know, auto in Germany can be really good. Uh, but as you said, very much just depends on the category. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, UK also has some really interesting ones like, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily count as a, a market base, but flub it, you know, flub it is, is a really cool one. Hmm. Um, and, an interesting concept that, that you can look at. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity out there, but, you know, even going beyond sort of the, the, the confines of Europe, um, you know, Japan, right, uh, Mexico, uh, South America in general with Mercado Libra offers a, a huge potential, um, especially if you uh, utilize things like Amazon FBA in the U.S. to send to Mexico. Um, you know, really good idea there. And, uh, you know, I've mentioned Japan a couple of times, but, you know, whether you can get on Rakuten if you can sort of fulfill the requirements to do that uh, or Amazon Japan, right, which is a little bit, a little bit more familiar. Um, great opportunities for you. What do you find the hardest to translate or to to get on out of the marketplaces? Right. I, let's say one of the marketplaces, which is probably uh, the most challenging, is uh, is La Redoute in France. Um, the history of it was uh, sort of similar to how we had Sears in the U.S., and that was like the dominant catalog marketplace for right. really decades. Uh, La Redoute had you know this incredible history, and um, they were a little bit late getting into the online game, but when they did, uh, they decided where okay, we, we can't really compete with the likes of uh, of Amazon or sort of you know these up and coming ones like C Discount, which have lower prices. So we're going to sort of stick with what we do best, and we're going to go for the high end. Um, so I believe you know through our partnership with La Redoute, uh, we've heard that they generally accept about three percent of the sellers who actually ask to sell on their market. Really, so, only three percent? Three percent, yeah. So. It's like the Harvard of marketplaces or something? It's or? incredible. It's incredible, right? So Why do they um, do that? You know, they, well, number one, they sell their own brand. So to that extent, I think they don't want the competition on there. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I, you know, I, I think they do want to keep it almost a bit elitist. Like when you look at the, uh, you know, that clientele that, to buy that in France, especially with French fashion and all this, um, you know, they, they do want to be that upper level. They want to keep it and they, they retain top that. tier. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Yeah. So from the challenges, what have been some of the milestones that you're proud of? The milestones, you know, I, I think that links right in with the challenges. It's been great to be able to uh, to deliver some of the things that the people have needed. For example, you know, that quick turnaround time on on global returns, right, to be able to off offer those local return warehouses. Yeah. Um, you know, also different languages that people have requested as well, um, you know, with – you know, at this point, we have around about 55 people um, in house, and uh, and of that, 16 different nationalities, right? So, even though that sounds like a lot, we're still nimble enough to be able to like add on languages relatively quickly yeah. as we see them uh, needed. Um, one of the latest ones that we've uh, popped on is is Sweden uh, and Swedish, right? Mm. Uh, for uh, Findig is a you know, marketplace has been established there for a while, but more and more, especially Europeans, want to go into the Nordics, and that's a great way to get in there. So I think a milestone for us um, has been add, able to, to add those languages uh, as quickly as we have. What have you found, Scott, in the German market or German Amazon that is very popular, that to you it's obvious, but if someone from the U.S. looked at the categories and the products, they would have no idea, like, this is one of the most popular products in, in Germany? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if there's there's a specific product that that I would say because I, I think a lot of the same things sell pretty well. Yeah. Um, 
to, to maybe switch the question a little bit, uh, one thing which, which a lot of people find quite useful is, especially if you're selling from the States, is if you, if you develop or, you know, and or manufacture something in the States, right, um, it can be great to actually sell that uh, in Germany and really market it as such, right? We're really? Very big on, Made in the yeah, USA. Ab- Absolutely, right? Because you know any types of sort of sporting equipment um, or you know any types of products that that American um, Americans really have a name for, uh, you know, you want to advertise that uh, in foreign countries because it, it does get some airplay. This you know we're big proponents of you know if it's made in Germany, definitely saying that. If you can slap a Union Jack on it, uh, you know that generally gets more sales in foreign countries. So uh, to that extent, anything produced in the USA definitely advertise that. What's the perception of the U.S. in Germany? in the e-commerce world. Like you just said, made in USA that has a certain status. I would actually think, yeah, if a German on it, that would have more status than made in the USA. Um, what's the perception of the US from, I mean, you've lived there for, since 2000, for 17 years at this point. Yeah. Are there certain like I, commonly held beliefs that would surprise me or people in the US? Right, yeah. I think, but perhaps, perhaps, yeah. I mean, the anything to do with with uh, with healthcare, with sporting equipment, things like that, tends to be pretty well respected. I would, I would say, in the U.S. Um, well, let's say you know, if if uh, Germans see that it's coming from the U.S., that's sort of developed there, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's there's a general respect for it. Um, I think you know, technology and things like that, they they very often like that, you know, coming from Germany, but uh, right. But yeah, you know, like manufacturing, uh, like Germany, like what what would they consider is, I guess, higher perceived value in U.S. and then what's considered higher perceived value in Germany? So the sports and then the healthcare is more uh, maybe higher perceived in the U.S. What would be higher perceived is in uh, German compared to U.S. Gotcha, right? I mean, I I think any sort of uh, technology. Or things like that. I mean, you know, everything. You have the sort of stereotypes of cars and things like that. Right, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that that type of thing. I think they like to buy German. You'll see a lot of BMWs and, and Mercedes driving around. Um, so I think there's a general uh, understanding that they feel like they're sort of uh, superior with that type of thing. Yeah. Uh, but they you know, a are. lot of other. Yeah. <laughs> and it could be. And, but but uh, you know. But you know. We always like to think of these things as the, everything is just sort of different, right? And you can sell, and it's sort of funny because even my German friends here, you know, sometimes I'll go on about, uh, you know, the craft beers in the U.S. And um, the stereotype there they is everybody's just like, yeah, everybody's just like, what? American beer is terrible. And I was just like, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, maybe 20 years ago. But if you look at, you know, this this whole industry, which has uh, sprung up and now, like, you know, every other town have, has its own craft brewery. Right. Um, it's incredible stuff, right? So I think we have to see it as that. And you have to be able to, if you have a good story behind your product, then you can make it so it's attractive. I yeah. think that's one of the most important things. Mm-hmm. We shouldn't sort of hide behind or, or get stifled by stereotypes. Instead, tell your story. So, Scott, what um, level seller would be a good fit for intercultural elements? I assume not everyone is. Who Who's a good fit to actually use you? Right, right. You know, we have everybody from relatively small sellers all the way up to sort of smaller enterprise level. Mm-hmm. Um, so we can cater to everybody. And, and I think we can do that because uh, we have an account manager who is your main contact. Um, but that account manager, let's say that she's French in one case, right? As soon as you're expanding to, uh, you know, to Spain, then she'll turn around and get, you know, the Spanish account manager to then help her uh, to, to get you onto those marketplaces, right? Um, so to that extent, you know, I would say that the only size limitation is you have to be um, able to be able to ship more product and um, really keep up with the sales. I, I think that's that's the biggest thing. So a lot of our most successful sellers um, have been people who have started off, you know, really selling pretty well, maybe like, let's say, 10,000 a month, something like that. Um, and uh, but yeah, I mean, you don't have to be real big to, to start expanding, you mm-hmm. know. So I want you to talk a little bit about some of the, you probably see a lot of people using various softwares and things like that. What um, softwares and products do you recommend to some of your, your sellers that they use? Right. Gotcha. So I think the, the main software that, that we're um, 
and a day-to-day uh, sort of touch point with is our, our listing tools. Mm-hmm. So you know you have the standard ones out there that I'm sure everybody's aware of, uh, but you know I think some that do a really good job. You know everything from sort of like Volo, Linworks, uh, Channel Advisor are some of the ones that we deal with the most. Um, but you know there's there's tons of them out there. Um, I think the key is really just making sure that uh, given your expansion goals. Right. Um, you know, don't get into a listing tool or any other software for that matter that that can't cater to where you want to go, mm-hmm. uh, because that's one limitation that we see. People go down the wrong road. They, you know, they sort of paint themselves into a corner and then can't expand because the software doesn't cater. to. You it. mean they get the wrong listing tool for their needs? It, exactly. Exactly. Uh, it, you know, very often when people come to us, they say, you know, I want to take over the world. Right. I want to go to these like 10 different countries. And we say, great, perfect. What kind of listing tool are you using? And then we find out that they, it can only go to two countries. Right. So um, I think on on the this the seller's part, you know, just make sure that uh, the software is big enough for your dreams. Yeah. Um, and then hopefully, uh, you know, software wise, you know, it, it is nice to see that uh, a lot of these companies are developing uh, sort of in the breadth as as well as in the depth of just their home country. So what are some of the common ones you see? You see Channel Advisor, who else? What are some of the other common ones people are using? Right. I mean, you know, like I said, a, co- a couple of ones that we see on a pretty uh, common basis, uh, Volo, since we have a lot of UK sellers, mm-hmm. um, that tends to, to, to go pretty well. Uh, Linworks is uh, relatively inexpensive mm-hmm. um, and serves a lot of sellers quite well. Um, again, UK based. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's other ones in Germany too, uh, ones like Plenty Markets, Tradebyte, um, you know, all good software. Um, you know, you just have to take a look at it and make sure that it, it, it serves your needs. Yeah. So besides listing tools, what other software are people using that you'd uh, say look into? Right, exactly. You know, to be honest, we, we really, uh, we rely a lot more on sort of our, our internal, um, yeah, account managers and things like that. So actually, there's really not a lot of uh, of a lot of other software that that we deal with, besides, of course, uh, you know, Amazon Seller Central. That's something yeah. a lot of sellers use, but but not a lot of uh, other ones. You have something called Amazon Scout. Correct. What's that? Right. So we have the uh, you know, a lot of our sellers have the issue that uh, let's say that, that you're a seller, you sell a bunch of products. Let's say two thousand products. Um, now, I've mentioned a couple times you want to find a, a proper strategy, right, before going abroad. Yeah. Instead of just saying, well, I've gotten some sales from the UK, I'll go there, right? Um, you know, since it takes so much time and effort and resource to go into a new marketplace, you want to make sure that you're, gonna, you're going uh, to the best marketplace. So Amazon Scout is a way to do that. What it does is it takes your UPCs or EANs um, or ASINs if you have them, and it will then uh, search for all of those products on all the Amazons around the world. If it finds your products on other Amazons, it will return data on those. It'll include really important stuff like, okay, who's selling it in uh, country by country? What are the price points, right? Um, And based on that data, you can see a good number of things. Number one, you can see who your competition is, right? If you're going to be competitive in that market, right? and, you know, if you um, it's sort of hard to describe without s- sort of showing a chart here, but uh, basically we have charts which show pie charts and it will show uh, compared to the sellers who are currently selling that product. If you were to sell your products there, you're going to be cheaper on, let's say, 84 percent of it. So that's mm. a no brainer that you have to get into that. Right. Uh, to that market. Right. And of course, by identifying which uh, products are already sold there. Um, you know, you can, if it's the same product, you can piggyback on that listing. Hmm. So it negates the need to translate anything, right? You're there in, in an instant and very often you're cheaper. Yeah. So that's Amazon Scout in a nutshell. So Scott, I really appreciate your time on this. This is very interesting. I'm sure people make a ton of mistakes when going to all these foreign countries. Um, I have one last question, um, but I want people to check out um, the website. Where should we point people towards? I have intercultural dash elements dot eu are there any yep. other websites that we should point people towards or places online or is that the best place you know i think intercultural dash elements dot eu for european union that's that's the one to go to that's our home site okay. so, yeah. so before i ask the last question what have we not talked about that you think would be important with selling internationally or inter- intercultural elements right um you know one thing we haven't talked all that much about is customer service and hmm. that is 
that's another thing where we see people um, trip up on, especially when you're doing it yourself. So um, I would give the tip that, you know, uh, all the things we've talked about, you can get it translated correctly, localized, you can get it put it up there. Uh, and, you know, let's say that you're doing really well. It's all going to fall flat if you don't have that customer service backing you up. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain countries where you absolutely do not want to uh, or say it a different way. You want to have native speakers um, answering your emails. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Japan is probably uh, the yeah, best. How, do you, how would people do it on their own in Japan? They just throw in Google Translate and then Absolutely. upload it? Really? Yep. That's, that's how it, they do it? it, it Exactly. And, uh, and you know, one thing I would just mention, if I can, you know, th there's a great uh, uh, blog series, you know, this certain blog article that we have yeah. called Up and Coming Marketplaces. Uh, I think we published it last year and it was talking about uh, Where Mexico can and Japan. They find it? So right on our website, so intercultural-elements.eu mm -hmm. and then uh, there's a basically a resources, resources section and then a yeah. blog. And um, under that, we tell uh, a story of how um, – uh, right. So, so, so basically, uh, one of our Japanese uh, customer service representatives talked about how very often it has to do with the details, uh, something that we as Westerners wouldn't necessarily pay attention to. Mm -hmm. um, examples would be things like we actually got complaints from Japanese buyers who received a shirt and shirt itself was absolutely fine. The problem was that the tag, you know, the thing that you normally just rip off and throw away, that was bent slightly. And that warranted a complaint. Mm. Second one was yeah, somebody expected how do something you, to be. How do you avoid that? Though? <laughs> exactly. And that's the whole thing, right? Uh, but it, that's, you know, so to a large extent, it's, it's very difficult to avoid those types of things. But he basically says just be really careful of the details. Um, something that is probably avoidable, maybe a better example, is something was advertised to, go, to, to arrive in a box. Again, you throw the box away. It doesn't really matter. But it arrived in a bag. Um, and that warranted a complaint, even though the product itself was fine. Um, mm. But perhaps the, the key there, even more to, than, than how you treat your products, is uh, the customer service aspect. Mm -hmm. um, most Westerners don't know there's actually uh, multiple politeness forms in Japanese. And Google Translate simply cannot cater to that. It can't understand it. But if you use the wrong one, then you're pretty much guaranteeing yourself you're gonna um, somebody them. being yeah somebody's going to be offended and you're going to get a negative so hmm. uh, so yeah so customer service super important get native speakers you know it, it's something that intercultural elements offers but you know there's other companies out there as well that offer it but you know get natives to take care of that for you as you hmm. expand so scott my last question is sure. i'm curious what conferences you like um and then you're going to the Prosper Show. How can people Absolutely. get the most out of the Prosper Show when they go? Right. It, it's, to be honest, it's, it's hard not to. Um, yeah, so Prosper Show was uh, – it's, it's really uh, – so first time that it, it was sponsored was or that it was put on was last year. Um, and uh, and we sponsored it straight away because we thought it really catered to the clientele that, that we were looking to contact. Mm -hmm. um, and incredible. Um, so I, I gave a speech there last year. Uh, just really great, I think, turnout. But what did you very, talk about? So I talked about um, expansion into uh, a lot of marketplaces that the people may not necessarily expect to go to. So we sort of stayed away from the Amazons by and large, but we talked about everything from some of the emerging ones in like Southeast Asia to South America um, to, to other you know ones that you may not expect even in Europe. Uh, so yeah, so chat about that. But you know, Prosper Show is a, is a great show to go to. Um, that's coming up in, in just a, a you know a month or two. Um, I definitely recommend that. That's one of my favorite ones. Um, yeah, I mean, some other ones where I find that you find some really good content. Um, you know, Channel Advisors Catalyst, right? Uh, they have one on both sides of the pond, right? Um, that's really great. Um, and then you know, a lot of the ones that are that are out there, um, IRCE in Chicago. Um, so we're heading that to the uh, to that for the first time this year, but heard that that's really full with great content. Um, and then some European ones actually uh, that are up and coming as well. Nice. Uh, yeah. So in any case, Scott, I appreciate your time. This has been great. Everyone should check out intercultural-elements.eu, and if they want to sell internationally, they need to check it out. Great. Hey, thanks so much for your time, Jared. Thanks, Scott. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a beach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand